As someone who grew up in the suburbs, it's a common belief that public transit sucks, that it's inconvenient, unreliable, and dangerous, and well, that's because it was. In a car-centric society, driving is the norm and public transit is inferior. Rather than a convenient alternative to driving, it's something you have to put up with before you get your license. But public transit doesn't have to suck. We spend a huge portion of our lives commuting and longer commute times have significant effects on our mental health. So it should be crucial that we make it a more enjoyable and productive experience. Public transit is something millions of people use every single day. So what if we actually made it nice? Rather than a necessary evil that we have to put up with every day, what if it was the highlight of your day? What if you could relax after a long day at work instead of developing survival tactics and fearing for your life. All this is possible if we make it a priority. If we saw the value of reducing traffic and making the city more accessible and equitable. So why is transit so bad in most of North America and what can we do about it? There's a concept called the Downs-Thompson Paradox, which states that building more and more roads will make traffic worse until it becomes faster to take public transit. In other words, the only way to reduce traffic and increase transit ridership is by disincentivizing driving and making transit faster. But when buses and streetcars get stuck in the same traffic as cars, everyone will just prefer to drive, meaning the only people who take transit are the poor and the desperate. This leads to transit being neglected since most important decision makers probably drive and it develops a bad reputation as many people can't sympathize with transit users. It even becomes a nuisance for drivers and they complain when a bus gets in their way. This starts a vicious cycle. Bad transit service leads to low ridership and negligence, but when no one cares about the transit service, it never improves. In a car-centric society, cars get prioritized over everything, but when traffic becomes too unbearable to handle, Many cities opt for a quick solution, usually slapping on some new bus route. But this is just a band-aid solution that doesn't actually solve any problems because they never deprioritize the cars. Toronto is one of the few North American cities that didn't tear out their entire streetcar network in the 20th century, and that paid off because today it's a critical part of the city's transit network. There are some streets with dedicated lanes for them, but these are still far and few between. The main issue is that many intersections lack Transit Signal Priority, or TSP, which would allow transit vehicles to trigger green lights at intersections and proceed before other traffic. This means that streetcars carrying dozens of people have to wait, while Susan in her SUV gets to make a left turn first. The city does have TSP at certain locations, but ideally it should be everywhere especially streets with dedicated streetcar lanes. Streetcars getting stuck behind traffic rather than getting full priority means they are always delayed. Majority of all streetcars in Toronto are running behind schedule, and this of course further perpetuates the negative stereotypes that already surround them. This is what happens when the people in charge of public transit doesn't take public transit themselves. I recently visited China and took the subway in multiple cities, and compared to my hometown, it was night and day. There's security checks at every entrance making it really safe, stations are extremely clean and well maintained, and throughout my entire trip I did not face a single delay, which are daily occurrences where I live. It's also the small quality of light details like platform doors, ubiquitous cell service, and being able to pay with your phone. Even the wayfinding system and overall design is pretty much the same throughout the entire country, making the subway easy to use no matter what city you're in. Meanwhile, North American cities do the bare minimum when it comes to improving the quality of their service, and they wonder why the ridership numbers are so low. Most bus stops, even some in the busiest parts of downtown, don't even have shelters. It's bad enough to have to wait half an hour for a delayed bus, but it's even worse when you're standing in the scorching sun or the pouring rain next to a six-lane strode, breathing in the toxic exhaust fumes, and listening to the constant sound of traffic. 
The quality of transit doesn't just lie in the vehicles. Bus stops and train stations need to be comfortable, safe, and clean. They need to be inviting for the people that use them, not just some afterthought. There's another obvious and critical aspect for good public transit. Coverage. Metros all across Asia and Europe cover most, if not all, areas of the city. Meanwhile, in North America, you'd be lucky if your city has any trains at all. Areas with demand for transit but lack the adequate supply are called transit deserts. And this is really bad when you want to go somewhere, but the fastest route is an hour-long bus ride. But transit deserts have a much bigger implication. They reinforce inequality. Poor transportation is a major barrier for accessing jobs, food, healthcare, and education. These parts of cities are usually the poorest, where low-income residents can't afford to drive and rely on slow, crappy buses that get stuck in traffic. How are you gonna get to work on time when the bus just doesn't show up? Historically, major transit projects have always benefited the wealthy while neglecting those who rely on it the most. Rich people tend to have more political power, and transit is usually only built along key corridors that are already thriving, such as booming commercial districts or major transit hubs. This leaves the inner suburbs in a cycle of poverty. These were poor areas to begin with, and with the lack of access to important services, they will probably stay that way. Apart from having good service, Public transit also needs good land use. The area around a transit stop accessible by walking is called the walk shed, and it's some of the most valuable land in the city. Transit users need to be able to get off and immediately have access to walkable destinations. But in most of the US and Canada, the walk shed around a transit stop mainly consists of massive parking lots or high-speed strodes. These are ugly and deadly environments that no one wants to be in. When a transit user gets off here, where are they supposed to go? Unsurprisingly, most people living in the suburbs drive to their final destination after getting off the train. But your transit system has already failed when you have to drive to the station. The fundamental issue is that the car infrastructure is built first and transit is layered over it. It's simply an afterthought, but it doesn't work that way. Transit needs to be fully integrated and compatible with the built environments. The solution to this is Transit Oriented Development, or TOD, which allows the area around a transit station to be upzoned, allowing higher density. A 2009 study closely analyzed a low density suburb in Northern Toronto and found that over the course of 15 years, dense transit-oriented development around rapid transit stops led to a modal shift in the area. Car ownership and car use decreased, while walking and transit ridership increased. Transit-oriented development is not some new concept. It's how we've been building cities throughout history. The Bay Ridge Avenue station in Brooklyn, New York opened in 1916 in a low-density neighborhood. But because of the new access to the rest of the city, houses, shops, and apartments sprung up in the area, creating a thriving community centered around the subway station. In a more recent example, images of this new subway station in Chongqing, China were going viral, showing how the stupid Chinese built the subway to the middle of nowhere. But this is what the area looks like today. The subway station made way for a new development, and it's now a bustling district of the city. But probably the worst example of the lack of TOD that I've ever seen is the area around the train station in Niagara Falls. If you saw this for the first time, you would never guess that this is Canada's most popular tourist attraction. Now, I do want to end off this video on a positive note. Transit is steadily improving in many places, most notably Montreal, which just opened the REM, a new modern metro line with platform doors, automated trains, and massive stations. Honolulu also recently opened their new metro line, and man, after visiting Hawaii a few months ago, they really needed it. Toronto has the largest transit expansion plan on the continent, with two LRT lines opening soon, hopefully, a new subway line and a subway extension being built, and many, many more projects being planned or under construction already. In general, the fundamental reason why public transit is so bad in North America comes down to negligence and the prioritization of automobiles. But with enough awareness and political will, we can get out of this vicious cycle 
And that's important as five alternatives to driving benefits everyone, including drivers. In the words of Colombian President Gustavo Petro, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich use public transportation.